Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to Wellversed again. Happy to be together, and I pray that we'll all be a little better informed and blessed when we finished in a few minutes' time. So welcome, and I invite you to sit back and let's do some work with us. We're looking at Philippians, as I explained last week. These are the two kind of introductory things from chapter 1. So I want to read from chapter 1, Philippians 1, from verse 12 through to 27, under a title that I put on it of Advancing the Gospel. So let's see how we go from verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace God and to everyone else that I am in change for Christ. Obviously, you gather that Paul's in prison. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. That's quite a thought, folks, if you stop and think about it. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Not easy to write that in prison, hey? I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a fantastic verse, by the way. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Just to there. I think it's safe to say that uh, Paul was in a bad situation. He wrote this as a prisoner, and however much you want to think about that, that would be a very bad place to be. And yet, and yet here was God bringing good out of it. The letter that he's written, God has used this letter enormously. If you think about it, and he says it in verse 12, Paul's suffering had actually served to advance the gospel. He was actually setting an example of what it means to be a disciple. And because of his prison time, his fellow Christians in Rome were encouraged to be more courageous and fearless. Are you and I suffering because of the gospel? I doubt it. I think not. How would you cope with suffering for the gospel and one could spend some time a lot of time with that one paul goes on into verse 15 and he starts talking about jealousy someone once said that jealousy is the green-eyed monster and it's probably true paul's enemies were looking for ways to break him down and how to puff themselves up the whole motivation for this was jealousy and so if we turn that question backwards how do you or I handle other people's success? We can preach the gospel, we can even live the gospel, but we can do it with the wrong motives. And I guess that that's true for many people. It's still true in our day and age. Many people preach the gospel, but the motivation is something else. And so I want to ask a question of us this morning. Do our lives, do our lives tell the Jesus story? Not just our words, but do our lives tell the story? Because you see, people very often don't listen to the words they watch and they look at what people are doing and what people are saying. So how are we doing? How do we do with envy? And how do we do with rivalry? You know, for many people, life is a competition. 
know, I've got to beat you. I've got to do better than you. You know, I can't allow you to do better than me. How do we deal with envy? Are we envious of people around us who we perceive to be better off than us or cleverer than us or more successful than us? I don't know. On the same tech, how are we with loving? How are we doing with loving one another? How are we doing with caring for one another? I preached a sermon on Sunday about community. And in a sense, community is about loving and caring for one another and living in such a way that folk are blessed. And so, and yet another question. When you're feeling down, what helps you get on top of it? Only you can answer that. Would you consider yourself happy? As you listen to this this morning, would you consider yourself happy or coping or sinking? And in that context, where does Jesus fit in there? And maybe you're going to need to stop and think about that for a moment. Do we instinctively turn to Jesus Christ for all the things that are happening in our lives, not just the good or the bad, but both? Do we instinctively turn to Christ, or are we what I like to call lone rangers? And we do it by ourselves. I'll go it alone. And in the same context, I ask the question, are our lives telling the Jesus story? And I want to suggest that telling the Jesus story is not so much spoken as lived. People will look at us if they know that we are Christians and they will expect us and look to us to set an example of what Christians should be and how Christians should behave. Do our lives tell the Jesus story? We can talk about it, but ultimately I think what we act out, the way we put our words into action, speaks a lot more eloquently than the words we use. And then moving on a little, perhaps in verse 19, Paul talks about deliverance or maybe salvation. There's a whole topic around deliverance and today's not the day for that. But Paul is not talking so much about salvation or deliverance in the next life. Also, Paul's salvation will come through the prayers of his friends and the help of and by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Paul sees himself as part of the community. He sees himself as part of the big picture. And so your prayers and my prayers are very important in fulfilling God's purposes. Because who knows that you might say something to someone which will turn their life around. And you say it with faith and you say it with gentleness, sometimes with strength. <laughs> But I don't think we understand that our encouragement of people around us, our presence with people around us, our example to people around us, speak sometimes much more eloquently than the words. And likewise, Paul's saying it again in verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. What Paul's actually saying is, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for encouraging me. Thank you. I feel your prayers alongside me, even as I sit here in prison. I feel the power of the Spirit with me, even as I sit here in prison. Now, I wonder, what goes through a person's mind when they sit in prison? And that 21st verse, probably this is the key verse in this little passage. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Put it this way, everything that Paul did in his life, he did for Christ's sake. Without Christ in his life, Paul was nothing, and he knew it. His whole purpose of his ministry was to serve Christ and glorify God. His whole ministry was geared to setting an example to show people how the gospel looks, what it looks like, not just in theory, but what it looks like. And so in verse 27, he says, whatever happens, 
conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospels. The gospels, my friends, are not preached so much as lived. We can preach the gospel until we blew in the face. But do we live the gospels? Do, we, do our lives tell the story? Not our mouths necessarily, but do our lives tell the story? Does your church, our church, tell the story of Jesus? Do we project the image of unity in Christ as the church? Because this is a crucial question. Does the church live the story of Christ? Are we together? Are we in love together? Are we in harmony with one another? Are we forgiving one another? Are we courageous? Are we strong? Do people look at our church, your church, my church, and do they see a community of people filled with joy and hope and strength and courage and determination to just be God's people? I think that this is what Paul was trying to say to the Philippian church in this little letter. Just hang in there, folks. Hang in there. God is with you. Now, those words are appropriate for then and just as much today. God is with you. God is with us. May it be so. May it be so. Let's pray a moment. Father, I, as I begin to pray, I remember my mother's life verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Lord, I guess that's what we're trying to say here this morning. We can do all things with you alongside us. We can do all things when you're part of our journey, when we put you first in our lives, when we allow you to lead us and encourage us and sometimes challenge us. And so thank you, Father, that we can celebrate our faith in you in this moment. Thank you that we can reflect that you just want the very best for us and you call us to just come faithfully with you on the journey of life and know that if we do this, all will be well. And so bless us, O oh God, now as we go our separate ways and may your spirit and your power and your peace be with us today and always. In Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace, folks, and have a wonderful day.